Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Sally Mapstone, principal of the university, and it's a great pleasure on behalf of the University of St. Andrews to welcome you all here to the Bayer Theatre to this open lecture organized by the Equality and Diversity Committee of the School of Biology. We are really thrilled that Dame Linda Partridge, Weldon Professor of Biometry at University College London and founding director of the Max Planck Institute for the Biology of Aging, will be delivering today's lecture on aging healthily. I, I must apologize that I can't stay to hear Linda's lecture myself, and I can tell you that if anybody needed to hear a lecture on aging, aging healthily, it's me. Um, but I've just come up on the plane from London today, and we've, got, we've had to fit some um, urgent business into my diary over lunchtime. So I'm really sorry that I'm going to be missing a lecture I clearly should be listening to, and which I know will be both fascinating and inspirational. In a few minutes, uh, Dame Linda will be introduced to you more fully by Professor Will Cresswell, who amongst his own many distinctions is also a former doctoral student of Dame Linda's. I would like to set the scene for Linda's lecture by placing our own engagement initiatives to promote the involvement of women and girls in science into context. So as many people here will know, I, I see inclusiveness as a crucial part of our institutional priorities here in St. Andrews, and it is a strong part of my own personal agenda. A genuinely diverse community is a forward-looking community which has depth, strength, and an appetite for challenge and exploration, all things that keep the university on the front foot. Inclusiveness is something to which a whole institution approach has to be taken. It matters in every school, in every service unit, and to every student. But it isn't enough just to say that. You need to do things to show that inclusiveness matters and to carry on doing them, because while change can come radically and dramatically, as we've seen recently politically, of course, it can also come cumulatively through a combination of deliberate interventions and a determined shift in culture. That is the approach we're taking in the area of gender equality to our Athena Swan Institutional Bronze Award renewal submission at the moment. We've undertaken some significant interventions, including the establishment of our first university nursery, revisions to our promotions procedures that have the capacity to increase female recognition, the establishment of clearer workload principles and, career and carer oriented core hours, providing seed funding for nine new research projects on gender, diversity, and inclusion themes, and launching the Elizabeth Garrett mentoring scheme for mid-career academic women. At the same time, we have developed strong engagement across the university by involving our academic community, professional services staff, and student representatives in a collaborative approach. So interventions from the top can make a, a, a real difference, but we also need to encourage interventions and initiatives at every level of the university because we all have a responsibility to take ownership of change. I've been delighted to see the strong lead taken by St. Andrews members of the Young Academy of Scotland who are undertaking a research project on the experiences of mid to senior career women. And of course, initiatives like this lecture today also make a difference. Although progress is being made, and biology is one good example where this is happening in the UK and in St. Andrews, where we have pretty impressive proportions of women at all levels, staff and student, women continue to be underrepresented in every area of science. This is an important area for the UK and Scottish governments, which are looking to improve the numbers of workers in STEM areas, but it is intrinsically important too. Women and girls should engage with life choices fully and with a genuine sense of all the possibilities available to them. So again, let me acknowledge the work of the Equality and Diversity Committee in the School of Biology, particularly its chair, Dr. Sasha Hooker, in making this happen. The intention is that we should make a lecture of this sort an annual event, 
to recognize the critical role women and girls play in science and technology communities, and to promote female participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It is unequivocally and rightly the case that female role models make a real difference. They give women a sense of what they can achieve, and indeed they show us all what women can do. We'll hear more about Dame Linda's inspiring career from Will in a moment, but I should like to highlight her nomination as one of the UK's Women of Outstanding Achievement in Science, Engineering and Technology, as just one of the many reasons she is an excellent role model for the next generation of biologists. Here in St Andrews, we have our own pioneering female scientists in which we take pride. During my installation about a year ago now, I paid tribute to Margaret Fairley, a graduate in medicine from this university who became the first woman to hold a chair at a Scottish university, this university, in the 1940s. And also to Ursula Martin, who became the university's second uh, woman professor uh, in computer science in 1992. Uh, I mean, it's very striking that we took us about 50 years to have the nerve to appoint another woman, uh, and who uh, returned to give three terrific lectures in one day last month on Ada Lovelace Day. Let's remind ourselves that today we have 50 women professors. Now that's just about a fifth of the university's total, so we still have some distance to travel but we are very deliberately embarked on the journey. St Andrews is actually unusual amongst UK universities in having had two female principals in succession. We need to build on that by establishing a critical mass, a strong pipeline of women who will become the initiators and leaders of the next generation. And we can do this by listening to the experience, expertise, and arguments of women who have already made a fundamental difference to how science is practiced and perceived. Dame Linda Partridge more than fulfills those criteria, and it's now my very pleasant task to invite Will Cresswell to introduce her to you. Hello everybody, um, I'm going to stay away from the dame jokes because the last time I saw a dame on this stage was at the Panto at Christmas. Uh, Linda Partridge started her career as a behavioural ecologist carrying out her PhD at Oxford with one of the fathers of the discipline, uh, John Krebs. And perhaps surprisingly her PhD dissertation subject was on the foraging ecology of blue tits and grey tits. But perhaps it's not actually surprising because at the time, evolutionary ecology was becoming framed as a discipline where instead of the traditional approach of where you went out and you looked at animals and by and by various evolutionary truths might come out, you started with a question instead. And then from that question, you identified the best study system to work on much more efficient, much more focused, and this is a hallmark of Linda's career. She moved on, inevitably, I would say then, to studies in mice and Drosophila, and in the early 1980s uh, at Edinburgh, started the work which has made her the internationally renowned scientist that she still is, looking at, for example, how reproduction impacts on your lifespan and other life history traits. Linda was duly elected to, as a fellow of the Royal Society in 1996. She continued her career down in London, um, going to University College, and she became the director of the Institute of Healthy Aging in 2007. It's a very prestigious institute, but then in 2008, she also became one of the founding directors of the Max Planck Institute of uh, the biology of aging. So two of the most prestigious and influential research institutes in, in Europe being managed by one person. Two jobs. I think that's John Krebs' influence, possibly. <laughs> as well as this huge administrative burden, Linda's scientific output is, well, phenomenal. It's an easy word to use, but it is fairly phenomenal. 
over 300 papers, tens of thousands of citations, and an H index of over 80. Now you're thinking, H index. Well, that's, this is the arcane method that we academics keep score. And to put it in perspective, if you reach the end of your career and you've gone over an H index of about 60, you're doing phenomenally well. And during an academic career, you might hope to produce you know, one or two papers in the top journals, get something in nature, get something in science. If you're really good, you might have a handful in a career. Well, I lost count counting up Linda's. She's got over 30 proper papers in nature and over 14 in science. So that works out about one a year for every year of Linda's career. Absolutely fantastic, really. And of course, she's trained lots of people. I was lucky enough to be one of Linda's uh, doctoral students, and they're spread out all, all over the world now. But they've become professors. I had my first doctoral student that became a professor, which I think makes you a great, great academic <laughs> grandmother <laughs> or something. But we are talking about aging healthily, so that, I think that's probably an indication. Indication. I'll just finish up before I hand, hand you over to Linda, who you've come, come to hear with two of the best pieces of advice that Linda gave me at the start of my career and have really stood me in good stead. She's been an absolutely fantastic role model uh, to me. First piece of advice goes back to what, how I started. You should always identify the best study system to most efficiently answer your question. But even more importantly, and I think this comes from Linda's uh, background in ornithology and bird watching, understand the natural history and the biology in your system. So when things go slightly wrong and your results are slightly unexpected, you can actually interpret them properly as an opportunity to capitalize on and lead to really interesting conclusions. And Linda's done this uh, time and time again. Second piece of advice, it sounds really obvious, but she told me this in 1989 when email had just been invented. Her advice was, do your emails at the end of the day like 20 to 5, because you'll do them really efficiently because you want to go home. <laughs> and keep the rest of the day free from being hijacked by other people's agendas and administration so that you can concentrate on your science. And that is a very, very good rule. I think we all appreciate that now, but to appreciate that in 1989 is visionary. Anyway, let me hand you over uh, to Linda now. I'm very glad that you're pursuing possibly the most relevant biological question that we have. If you are not concerned about helping Asia yet, you will be. <laughs> Linda. Thank you very much, Paul, for a really charming introduction. And of course, one of the huge pleasures of being a scientist is that these wonderful young people turn up in the lab and you get to spend some time with them and then see how their own careers develop. And, you know, Will was top of my list there, a fantastic person to have in the lab. And I think I learned more from you than you learned from me, actually, Will. <laughs> Certainly on the bird watching front. And thank you very much for coming to the, the talk. So, can we cure the ills of aging? Uh, we've certainly been very good over the years at making ourselves live longer. So it's a trend that started in the middle of the 19th century in, in most developing countries throughout the world. And it's been going on at a very surprisingly steady rate ever since. So it's illustrated here by the work of these two demographers. And what they've done is to plot life expectancy at birth. So that's the length of time the average person's expected to live against the year in which the births took place for the country that happened to be the world leader at the time in terms of life expectancy. So to begin with, this tended down here to be the Scandinavian countries, um, the Antipodes, and others came in in between. And now, it, or at least recently, it's tended to be the Far East. And you can see this extraordinary, um, just steady increase of about two and a half years per decade increase in life expectancy, six hours a day. And the horizontal lines, uh, represent the predictions of various organizations about where the trend would top out for whatever reason. 
And what you can see is that in every case it's gone past it. So it's really not clear from the available data at the moment what the intrinsic limit on human lifespan is going to turn out to be. There's nothing, the actual point of this paper was to say there's no signal in the demography at the moment of, of where that trend will top out. And it is currently increasing. Um, there was a paper in Lancet earlier this, this year, and these are the countries for which there are good um, data on, on age at death um, over the period. And for all of them, the projection up to 2030, based on existing age-specific survival rates, is that the trend to increase is going to continue. The extent varies somewhat between different countries. And that results in these actual life expectancies projected for that year. So we've got women on the left and uh, men on the right. And you can see that for both, actually, South Korea looks as though it's going to be top of the list by then. The UK is doing pretty well for men, not, not quite so well for women. Um, the USA is the one I find really interesting, the richest country in the world, uh, but by no means the healthiest in terms of its life expectancy. And you've probably noticed that there's a difference in the x-axis here. So the women go from 75 to 95. Um, the men are here at 65. And that's because in all these countries, uh, men live less long than women do. But on the other hand, women have a higher um, period of ill health at the end of life. The, the period of loss of function and illness is longer for women than for men. And so the trend is, is continuing. And it's also producing some extraordinary lifespans. And I think these are two of the really interesting uh, record holders. As far as anybody knows, this is the absolute world record holder. She was a French lady, uh, Jean-Louise Calmont. She lived in the south of France. And she died in 1997 at the age of about 122 and a half. Not at all clear what the, the reason for her feat is. She came from quite a long-lived family. And human lifespan is about 25% heritable. There is a, a genetic element to it. Um, she was a bit mixed in terms of lifestyle. She apparently um, continued uh, to ride a bicycle until she was 110. <laughs> but on the other hand, she didn't give up smoking until she was 117. So <laughs> you know, who knows? And, and at least when I looked this, mo this morning, this Japanese lady um, is the longest uh, living person at the moment. Um, this tends to be a, a title that's not held for very long for obvious reasons. But as far as I know, she is, she is the current one. I think she is remarkable for really having a very prolific family. She had nine children herself, and she has 160 living descendants. <laughs> but so lots of longevity genes being disseminated into the population. So I think this is a triumph of, of civilization. Obviously, at different times in the trend, different kinds of improvement have gone on. Initially, it was um, childhood mortality, um, inoculations, um, antibiotics, clean water, better food supply. Um, latterly, most of the increase is happening amongst 70 and 80-year-olds, and it's, it's basically improved medical care. So something to be celebrated. But it's coming with the extremely obvious downside that advancing age is the major risk factor for all kinds of loss of function and pathology, including these, the, the major chronic and killer diseases of developed countries, so dementia, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. These are just the age-related instances from various EU and uh, UK records. Um, in fact, the age-specific instance of at least cardiovascular disease and dementia, so your likelihood of getting them at a particular age, is going down because the prevention with cardiovascular disease has been very good, and it is actually one of the major risk factors for dementia, so that's probably why dementia is going down as well. But because people are living longer, it means that the overall impact of these diseases is increasing. And the kind of work that I and many other people are involved in is, is, is trying to deal with this and associated conditions, trying to basically keep people healthier as they age and to reduce that period of morbidity and ill health at the end of life. So the overall aim isn't to make people live longer. That's happening already without people like us intervening. But that this ill health is clearly now falling on the older section of the population. And I regard it as a real responsibility for biomedical scientists to try and do something about it, to, to make people live a better life until they actually die. And I think increasingly, the way that people who do research on aging are looking at this is that since aging is the major risk factor for all these conditions, 
perhaps instead of doing what we do at the moment, which is waiting for people to get ill and then treating them and dealing with diseases in a piecemeal fashion, perhaps we can act preventatively with un in aspects of the underlying aging process itself, because it is the major risk factor, and prevent some of these diseases from happening in the first place. Now that may sound impractical, but actually there's, there's a lot of evidence and, and has been for a long time um, that there's a great deal of genetic variation for the rate of aging. Um, most of it, of course, not in our laboratories, out there in the natural world. And I think these are just some of the interesting cases. So the, the lifespans of these species are largely genetically determined. And you can see here the mammalian uh, record holder, this is the bowhead whale, and they were actually aged originally by the age of the harpoons that were found embedded in them, um, rather than the animals themselves. Um, this Greenland shark, I think it's about three or four years ago, um, was eventually discovered actually through radiocarbon dating, they live so long, um, to live nearly 400 years, and they don't even start breeding till they're 150. <laughs> so incredibly long lived. Um, this is probably the animal record holder, it's a bivalve that lives um, on the floor of the North Atlantic, um, you know, again, radiocarbon dating. And just to make the point, which must be obvious from this quahog, that, I mean, yes, bowhead whales and elephants are big and they live a long time. And I think this tends to give us the intuitive idea that you have to be big to live a long time, that somehow there's a causal association. But actually, there are almost certainly traits that both evolve in a low-risk kind of environment. Um, because there are many really small things that live a long time. So this naked mole rat's a particularly interesting case. They're very highly social mammals. They live in burrows um, in southern Africa. And there's just one breeding pair in a colony of non-reproductives that do most of the work. And they're about intermediate in size between a mouse and a rat, he, and they live about three years. These naked mole rats can live for 30 years probably because of this very protected environment, which means that they can evolve a long lifespan. I think one of the most extreme cases is this one. So this is a finger that this little pants bat is sit sitting on. It only weighs eight grams. They don't hibernate, and they can live for 40 years in nature. So there are plenty of cases where this association between size and lifespan has been broken. And actually, there are some organisms that don't age at all. Um, so these are two examples of them, this um, sea anemone, and especially hydra, this tiny little freshwater thing, has been very carefully <coughs> studied in a lot of long-term studies in the lab. And they just seem to flatline. They, 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 they have a very low death rate. They get no more likely to die as time goes by, and their reproductive rate doesn't go down. So these seem to be cases of either extremely slow or possibly even completely absent aging. So it's, it's not an inevitable trait. So what we would like to do is to discover what some of the genes are that enab are enabling these creatures either not to age at all or to age so slowly, understand how they work, and then see if these are processes that we might be able to modify in humans to keep them healthier. Um, as I've said, human lifespan is about 25% heritable, but most of the genes involved haven't been identified. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but there are some very sad cases in humans of accelerated aging, which have given um, some hints about possible mechanisms. So these are just two of these progeric um, syndromes. So they involve a whole cluster of traits that are normally um, part of the natural aging process, but not all of them. It only rec recapitulates part of the process. Um, the most extreme one is this hutchinson guilford progeria. So these children, at the age of about 18 months or two years, um, start to lose their hair and their subcutaneous fat. Um, they start to get atherosclerosis, furred up arteries, um, the joints start to deteriorate. And they usually live till about 12 or 13. Um, and it hasn't proved possible. Fortunately, it's an extremely rare syndrome. But you can see the appearance of aging in these clearly children. You know, that they're, they're having fun, but the, these processes of aging that are accelerated in them. When a syndrome is much less severe, um, it tends to come on in the late teens, and it's associated particularly, again, with atherosclerosis, deterioration of the circulatory system, but also cancer. And again, it's rare. They tend to survive to about age 50. But generally speaking, because what we're interested in doing is improving people's health 
during ageing, actually we're far more interested in genes that do the opposite, that can slow the ageing process rather than um, speed it up. And for this really at the moment we're relying quite a lot on animal work and the knowledge that comes from it. I should say these two sy syndromes are both very well understood mechanistically and they both involve um, problems with the way the genetic material is handled in the cell. So this one is actually something called um, a, a lamin. It, it's part of the envelope of the nucleus of the cell and the nucleus structure tends to break down and that's what causes the problems. This one is an error in DNA replication. It's something called a DNA helicase and it means that when the genetic material is replicated, errors creep in because the process isn't, um, doesn't have its normal fidelity. But for the animal studies, we've been very much reliant on these creatures. So these are the standard laboratory model organisms, very um, familiar to many of you in the room, I'm sure. This is budding yeast, um, much more familiar in the context of bread and beer. Um, these are worms. They're called Cenorhabditis elegans. They're a, a quite simple nematode worm um, that was brought in as a model organism probably about 30 years ago now. This is the fruit fly, which has been around in our labs for much longer, and of course, the mouse. And these have been extremely powerful systems for understanding all kinds of biological processes. So what you generally do is to go from the simple, so you try to understand something in the single-celled yeast or even in a bacterium, so maybe the transmission of genetic information or the way the metabolism in the cell works, and then you go to these somewhat more complicated multicellular invertebrates and see if you're seeing the same things there, and then to the much more complicated and, of course, more ethically challenging mouse. And the reason that works is because of the very powerful evolutionary conservation of a lot of these biological processes. You can often take a gene from one of these creatures or even from a human and put it back into another, and it, it does its function perfectly well in the other organism. There's that degree of conservation of function. But I think for a long time there was a lot of scepticism about whether that would be true for ageing because these animals face very different kinds of challenges as they go through their lives. They have different kinds of stresses, of different food supplies. And of course, they also age at very different rates. So the worm lives for about three weeks, fly for about three months, mouse for about three years. So is there really likely to be any uh, conservation? And I think really the, the floodgates on this one uh, broke with the work of somebody called Cynthia Kenyon who simply stopped thinking about the matter too hard and said, can we isolate genes that slow down the rate of aging? So what she did was to get some worms and she did a chemical mutagenesis. She just fed them something that alters the genetic material and simply asked, could she isolate strains of worms that live for longer than normal? And she found that they, she could, quite dramatically so. This is uh, Cynthia, she works in, in California. And this is one of the first genes that she isolated. It, it was called DAF2, I'll come on to what it is in a minute. And this is just a survival curve, so the number of animals left alive after um, days here. These are the controls, just the ordinary wild-type worms. These are the ones that have got the mutation in this gene. So a really quite dramatic increase in the mean and the maximum lifespan of the worms. And it took a long time to figure out what this gene was that she'd made a lesion in, but it turned out to encode a worm insulin, insulin-like growth factor, receptor. So insulin and insulin-like growth factor were very familiar in other contexts. Basically, they were well known in mammals. So insulin-like growth factor is very important in growth and in repair, tissue repair, if there's any form of damage. Insulin, of course, regulates blood sugar and is very important generally in the regulation of metabolism. And until she isolated this mutation, nobody actually suspected that insulin and insulin-like growth factor were present in worms or in invertebrates generally. But here it is now. What she'd done was to make a lesion in the receptor that didn't completely abolish its activity, it just slowed it down. So she somewhat tamped down the insulin IGF activity in the worm. And this is basically a good times uh, network. Ba what it does is to integrate the nutritional status, the stress status, the health status of the animal, and decide how much it can afford to do of costly activities, so growth, reproduction, repair, immune response and so on. And so what she's done is to essentially tamp down the activity of a network that would tell the worm it's got good times. So the worm now thinks it doesn't have such good times. It's artificially informed that life is not quite as rosy as it thought. And what it's doing is activating various cellular defense mechanisms in response to that. 
And very interestingly, these worms didn't just live for a long time with an extension of the moribund period at the end of life. They were wriggling around and healthy long after the controls of death. And she also found that when she put this mutation together with other mutations that produced worm models of aging-related diseases, she could actually rescue their effects. So this is one case in point. This is actually a worm, although it may not look like one, and it's a worm model of Alzheimer's disease. So what the person who developed this did was to express um, the A-beta peptide. So this is a toxic protein that's present in people with Alzheimer's disease. It's present in their brains. And it's expressed in the body wall muscles of the worm. So it's actually paralyzed at its back end and is just doing this slightly feeble twitching at the front end as a result of having this toxic protein in its muscles. But when she put the two uh, mutations together, she actually managed to completely rescue the phenotype. So this is what an ordinary wild-type worm looks like. This is actually a worm that's got the Alzheimer's mutation present, but also this mutation in the insulin IGF receptor. And you can see the remarkable difference between them. And she also found that she could get a major rescue in a worm model of cancer. So what these mutations are doing is not just making the wild-type worm healthier, they can actually combat some of the toxicity associated with aging-related disease. So this attracted a lot of interest, but I think also people thought it might be a worm peculiarity. It wasn't clear that this would have any relevance for humans. And eventually it became possible to ask that question directly because similar mutations were isolated in worms and flies. I'm sorry, flies and mice. And this just shows you some of the results here. So this is DAF2 again. This is the same mutation that we've just seen, although um, different data from different origins, why the curves look a bit different. This is a fly that's got a mutation in a slightly different bit of the network. Again, you can see the nice increase in lifespan and also the growth effect here in the flies. So this is a, a mutant female fly. You can see she's about half the size of the wild type. She doesn't need to be to live long. We can separate those two traits from each other. It's just something else that the pathway does. But really crucially, the exact equivalent of this mutation in the mouse here again, produces an extension of lifespan. Um, interestingly, in these two cases, um, it, the effect's a bit sex-specific. It, it has a stronger effect in females than in males, and we still don't quite understand why that is at the moment. But obviously, with a long-lived mouse, you're really interested in its health status. How, have we done what we would hope to do for people? So they were quite thoroughly phenotyped, and they show a very surprisingly broad spectrum improvement in health. In this case, just because of knocking out a single gene. So they've got better glucose homeostasis as they get older. They start out slightly insulin resistant, but as they go through middle and old age, the pancreas compensates, and they're really good at handling glucose. Uh, they've got a better immune profile. Um, they retain their agility and their motor function better as they get older. Um, they get less osteoporosis. Mice do get osteoporosis as they age. And you can see here a pair of uh, littermate sisters at the age of about 850 days. You can see the cataract here on the control. Um, the mutants get less of them. And also this ulcerative dermatitis, this strain in mice, about 40% of them get it on the head and nape as they get older. Never seen a case in the mutant mice. They're completely free of it. So what we have is these very different systems, the bones, the eyes, the skin, um, the musculoskeletal system, the immune system, all showing an improvement in function as a result of this one gene lesion. And again, in the mice, these mutations turn out to be able to combat um, specific disease models. Again, this is a case of Alzheimer's disease. And the, uh, the way that this was shown was using this Morris water maze. So what we've got again is a mouse that's expressing this toxic A-beta peptide in the neurons in the brain, and we can combine that with one of these uh, long-lived mutants, actually, in the IGF-1 uh, receptor in the mouse. And this maze lets you do um, a cognitive test of how good the mouse is at learning and remembering things. And actually, it was invented by somebody who used to be in the psychology department here at St. Andrews, Richard Morris. And what you've got is that this big drum with cloudy liquid in it, and you can just see a faint shadow here. And that's a platform that's just below the surface of the water. And the way that the training of the mouse is done is that there's a little flag on a stick on the platform, and the mouse is introduced here and swims around, doesn't particularly like swimming, and eventually finds where the platform 
is and can go and stand on it and stop swimming. And, and quite quickly learns that it's associated with the flag, so they rapidly learn to go to the spot. And actually the Alzheimer's mice can do that just as well. They can swim well and they can learn to recognize the flag and go to it. But what you then do is to remove the flag and again introduce the mouse and see whether it's learned these landmarks on the wall of the lab and can use them to find the platform. So give the Alzheimer's mouse a head start. There he goes. Um, they swim at their legs and you can see the tail going. The platform's just here. And what you'll notice with this mice is, is that it goes more or less randomly around the container, sorry. Whereas, if we look at the one with the mutant rescue, it confines its search much more to this, this part. It knows that the platform's somewhere here and actually finds it quite quickly. Now that's of course an anecdote, um, but what they did was repeated tests and quantification of what was going on here, full statistical analysis, and it's very clear that the um, IGF-1 receptor mutant completely rescues um, this effect in the Alzheimer's mouse. And these are the things that they were protected from. We've seen the memory impairment. Um, as they get much older, they show some motor problems that are reduced. There's less inflammation in the brain. This is shown here at two different magnifications. You can see the load of a beta in the AD mice, and they also start uh, losing neurons. All of this is rescued by this mutation. So, of course, there's a huge amount of interest now in exactly how this network is uh, rescuing the effects of aging, and a lot of work going on on it. But it's also being taken through to humans. And the way that people are doing that is by exploiting this 25% heritability of human lifespan. And there are a number of uh, longitudinal studies going on around the world now, particularly of long-lived families, because that heritability of lifespan seems to be concentrated in particular families that are extraordinarily long-lived, rather than as a smear through the population. It's probably actually based on what are known as ra rare alleles. And what people are doing are looking at those families and asking whether, for the human equivalent of the genes that have turned out to be interested, interesting in animals, do they have particular genetic variants? Do, does it look as though they're genetically unusual for these genes that turn out to be important in animal aging? And the answer seems to be turning out to be a, a, a fairly strong yes. And these are just some of the uh, studies that have come out uh, recently, so this is an insulin IGF one here. There's something called TOR. It doesn't matter what it is. It's very closely associated with the insulin network. Um, another one here. This FOXA3A is, is extremely interesting. It's a molecule in the network that is actually turned on when you tamp down the activity, so what these mutations do. And what it does is to go into the nucleus of the cell and turns on all kinds of genes that are involved in stress resistance, detoxification of... Uh, nasty chemicals, immune response, various forms of stress response. So it's almost certainly one of the key actors um, in the animals in, in producing the improvement in health. And it turns out that genetic variants in it in humans are very strongly associated, particularly with survival between 90 and 100. So it, it's beginning to look very much as though um, these findings are indeed relevant to humans. And of course, what we would be hoping for with humans is to actually go to drugs. So this network contains many proteins that are potential or actual drug targets, and we're not going to genetically alter humans, rather what we would hope to come up with is a protective, preventative medicine for diseases of aging. And one of the problems in the area has, uh, for a long time has always been that developing new drugs against aging would really be an extreme challenge. Um, these are just some of the reasons. So first of all, you'd be talking about everybody. Everybody wants to have improved health during aging. So a widespread population-based improvement. There are, of course, you know, a number of existing drugs that would, would fit with that general idea. So things that lower blood pressure, statins and so on, are taken very widely by a very large number of people who don't actually have cardiovascular disease. So I think the principle of prevention and taking a safe drug is there but this would be a very widespread one. We don't at the moment know at what age we need to intervene, so we don't know whether it would be fine to start taking drugs in middle age and then getting the full benefit, or whether you'd need to start early. Um, so that, that's obviously extremely important, again, for, for safety, and any drug that people, everybody's going to take for a long time has to be extremely safe. Um, 
the regulators also until very recently um, have not regarded aging as a disease. That is actually starting to change. But usually it's only possible to do a clinical trial of a drug against a specific condition. And usually with a subset of the population that either have a risk factor or an early stage of the disease. So again, that, that's a challenge. And of course, um, having these things taken up by the pharmaceutical industry, they need to be able to make money out of it. The trials will be very expensive. There are all kinds of challenges. But the really nice thing about the way that this has turned out is that because one of the prime candidates now is this insulin IGF TOR network, it's actually already known to be very important in aging related diseases. So it's well known to be involved in metabolic disease and also in cancer. Less clear about neurodegeneration. So this is just a cartoon of the uh, pathway, very, very highly simplified. So this was where the original Cynthia Kenyon mutation was in the receptor. Then there are various effectors inside the cells with um, rather obscure names. This pathway is particularly associated with cancer, this one with uh, metabolic disease. And then there are these various um, transcription factor effectors, including FOXO, which I've mentioned, which turn on all these stress response pathways. And actually, because this whole network has been so heavily implicated in age-related diseases, just as you'd expect if it's involved in the underlying aging process, there are a lot of existing drugs. So we can talk about repurposing drugs rather than having to invent new ones. And some are turning out to be um, interesting already. And one of them is rapamycin. Um, so what this does is to inhibit this thing, which is called TORC1. It's actually a big complex of proteins. And what rapamycin does is to disrupt the complex. It, it stops the proteins um, coming together and forming the complex properly. And so it reduces its activity. It tamps, tamps things down. Um, it's a natural product. It was actually first um, discovered on Easter Island. Um, it was discovered in the soil there. An expedition went looking for antibiotics in the soil. And what they found was that a bacterium that produced rapamycin, um, which actually reduces the growth rate of human cells. So it was an immediate candidate as a cancer chemotherapeutic and quite heavily studied. And eventually it became a licensed drug. And it's used particularly in these three contexts. So um, to prevent tissues after trans uh, rejection of tissues after transplant, so it can act as an immunosuppressant. Um, and it's used particularly after kidney transplant in that context. Um, it's used to stop uh, restenosis, so heart arteries flaring up again after surgery. And it's an anti-cancer chemotherapeutic for particular classes of cancer. And interestingly, it extends lifespan. So these are some data actually on the fly, Drosophila. Um, this was the cover of the journal in which it came out with the statues from Easter Island and the structure of the drug. And you can see not a very dramatic increase in lifespan, but dose dependent and quite repeatable. And in the fly, it's understood pretty well um, how it does that, what, what processes it activates to extend lifespan. But very importantly, it was the first drug that was shown to be capable of extending mammal lifespan because it was tried in mice. So these are uh, data from the US. And what you can see here is dose-dependent treatment of male mice at the top and female mice at the bottom. And again, it's slightly sex-specific. It, it's more effective in females than in males, and we'd really like to know why. But you can get this quite impressive increase in mouse lifespan. And of course, people are looking very carefully at the health status of the mice as they age. And just like the mutation that I mentioned earlier, they're showing a broad spectrum improvement in health in different systems. And I think there's really um, big, big scope for repurposing, probably not rapamycin itself, because it's a drug that, that, that does have quite strong side effects, although it extends lifespan at much lower doses than are used therapeutically. But people are starting to um, modify rapamycin chemically and also to develop a slightly different way of inhibiting that torque complex. And they're showing great promise. So, for instance, rapamycin turns out to be able to rescue um, symptoms in animal models of a lot of different neurodegenerative diseases. So Alzheimer's, but also Parkinson's, um, Huntington's disease. Uh, it's again very good at uh, causing the cell to get rid of toxic proteins. And there's been this very interesting essay on the topic. But very importantly, and almost certainly what's going to be its first application in aging, it turns out to hugely potentiate the response to immunization against flus. 
so this was first discovered in, in mice. So old mice, like old people, don't respond at all well to flu immunization. I think it is quite hilarious that the, the, it's targeted to my kind of age group, because of course if I get flu, it's, it's more serious than if a young person does. But actually, we respond really badly to it, and the same is true of old mice. So this is shown here, and this was the paper in which this, this came out. What here, we've got some experiments with mice who are being immunized against flu and then challenged with the virus. And what you can see, first of all, is that if you've got a young mouse that's immunized and you challenge it, it's fine. It doesn't die at all. But you, if you've got an old mouse that's been immunized, um, they die in, in large numbers almost as much as young mice that haven't been immunized at all. So, the, the, I mean, there's a slight protection, but really it's, it's pretty useless, just as in people. Up here, also, not just the young mice who've been immunized, are old mice who are pre-treated with rapamycin for three weeks. They're allowed to clear the drug and then subsequently immunize. And their response to immunization comes right up to the level of young immunized mice. And the reason for this is here what these blobs show is that what the drug has done is to get into the bone marrow and it's actually increased, it, it stimulated the uh, hematopoietic stem cells there and they're producing more of the class of white cells that respond to the vaccine. And it turns out from some work that the Vartis have just done that exactly the same is true in humans. So obviously in this case they didn't challenge them with the virus, but what they did was to get a bunch of old people, give one group pre-treatment with rapamycin, the other just a vehicle, and then they immunized them and simply looked at the response in the blood to the immunization. And it was hugely boosted in the uh, ones that were pre-treated with rapamycin. So I suspect this may well be one of its applications that actually comes online most quickly. As I say, probably not with rapamycin itself, an adapted version. But they're extending this trial at the moment. They're looking at pneumonia, uh, immunization, and they're also looking at the incidence of infections in the winter following um, the immunization and the treatment with rapamycin. So I think that this is coming on quite soon. So I think that's one interesting class of drugs. Um, another one, oddly enough, is lithium. And the reason for that is that lithium inhibits this thing, which is called GSK3. And that's important because if you tamp down insulin signaling, what happens is the signal comes down here and this thing actually becomes activated because normally this would repress it. And what you do is take away the break and so it becomes activated. And all the indications are that that's a bad thing to do. And lithium, therefore, would be a very useful drug to prevent the acti activation of this um, damaging bit of the network. So it's basically dealing with side effect. And it turns out that it's an anti-aging drug, at least in worms and in flies. So it extends worm, li worm lifespan, but at high doses is toxic. So lithium is normally um, used as a drug for the treatment of bipolar disorder, but it's a dangerous drug. You have to get the dose just right. So patients are constantly monitored to make sure that the serum concentrations in the correct range, um, because otherwise it can rapidly become extremely toxic. And these are the data for fly here. And again, like the worm, what you see is a dose-dependent increase in lifespan at the lower doses. But as I say, at high doses, it's extremely toxic. And these are just some um, epidemiological data from humans, basically associating all-cause mortality. So these blobs are different uh, prefectures in one region of Japan. And what we've got is all-cause mortality uh, plotted against the concentration of lithium in the drinking water. And you can see that there's quite a, a, a strong negative relationship. All cause mortality is down, the higher the tap water concentration. You always have to be a bit cautious about these epidemiological data. They can be confounding factors and, and so on. And these are actually very low doses. But I think it's an interesting um, association. So there are these drugs starting to come up and looking interesting for repurposing. And there's also been a very uh, major change in attitudes in the United States by the FDA, the people who license clinical trials, because what they've done is to just li license the first trial against aging itself. Um, so this is shown here. This is the, off the web page um, showing the license for the trial. And what's really interesting about it is this bit here, the condition, aging, and that's the first. And metformin's interesting because um, it's the first line of defense against type 2 diabetes these days. It's the standard drug, and it's an extremely effective one. 
for lowering blood glucose. And again, it, it's, it's a complicated drug because it almost certainly has more than one target, but some of them are in that nutrient sensing network that I just saw you, showed you. And they're proceeding quite cautiously at the moment. It's an extremely safe drug. A lot of people have taken it for a very long time. It's almost free of side effects. And they're simply looking at the moment at whether the drug mimics the changes in gene expression that happen in interventions that increase lifespan in the animal studies. So it's a slow start, but if this drug turns out to be effective, it can be used safe, safely straight away because that, such a lot is known about it. So that was a bit of horizon gazing, really. What, what about now? Are, th are there interventions that, that can help and can maintain health during aging? And actually, one of the ones that been, has been known about for longest and that almost certainly is brought about uh, by these molecular signaling networks that I've been showing you is called dietary restriction. So it was first discovered in rats and mice way back in the 1930s that if you put them on a diet, you just force them to eat less than what they would choose to eat if they, they could choose for themselves, then you see a huge increase in lifespan. And because it's been known about for such a long time, they've been th very thoroughly examined, and they sh show an extraordinarily broad spectrum improvement in health. Almost everything is improved. The only two things that are not are resistance to viruses and wound healing. If, I, if either of those crop up, they have to refeed, but otherwise they're healthier. And very recently, this has been shown, sorry, I should have said that it, that it seems to be a very widespread response. All of these um, model and non-model organisms have been shown to show it. And very recently, there's been a trial in rhesus monkeys. So there were these two very expensive long-term studies in the US. Rhesus monkeys live almost 40 years, and of course, you need quite a lot of them to get survival data. It's also an interesting case in science of two groups ostensibly doing the same study to answer the same question, and actually they implemented it very differently in terms of diet and other things. But what they both found was an astonishingly broad spectrum improvement in health in the monkeys. So these are just the ones that have come out so far. The papers on these studies are still being published. But you can see that, that there's, again, many different uh, systems in the animal and also um, several different age-related conditions uh, were all greatly ameliorated. So these animals were eating about 70% of what a monkey that was just left to its own devices would eat. So not very severe dietary restriction um, compared with what, what's often done in rodents where you can take them down to 50%. But it proved to be uh, very effective. So that sounds like a, a nice practical way in, except for the fact that the vast majority of humans can't maintain that true restriction. <laughs> they just don't have the willpower. Um, so there have been various um, attempts at proper clinical trials of dietary restriction in humans, and the problem is compliance. People just give up. Even at 90%, most people find it very difficult. Although, there, oddly enough, there is one um, culture that goes in for dietary restriction, that, although it's changing now, they're going over more to the Western diet. But this is the Okinawan Japanese way down um, in the south of Japan. And until recently, they, they had this uh, harahachibu, which means stop eating when you're 80% full. It, it was a, a real cultural thing. Um, don't eat till you're full. And that, of course, means the stomach doesn't stretch and a lot of the um, feedback mechanisms that indicate satiety come in sooner if you do that habitually, and both the adults and uh, the children eat a lot less even than the mainland Japanese, who already at the, at the time um, were long-lived and didn't eat much. And they have a very high proportion of centenarians. I've actually been to Okinawa, and people do look a lot younger than their years. And there was a very thorough study of them compared with Americans at the time um, when the, most Okinawans were still eating that diet. And again, they show um, a lot of improvements in health during aging. So it seems that they can do it, but it's not a very practical intervention for most people. So what can we do? Well, it turns out that you don't necessarily have to eat less. What you eat is also very important. And what's turned up recently, and I think has surprised a lot of people, including me, is the importance of protein in the diet. It's actually a very bad idea, particularly when young, to eat too much protein. So this is a summary of a lot of studies um, in worms, flies, and mice, as well as people. And the results are actually pretty consistent. And so this is just a sort of cartoon summary, really. 
And the story in People, um, which is based mainly on epidemiology, but a little bit on experimental work as well, is that up to about 65, somewhere in that range, low protein is a good idea. It reduces overall mortality. And one of the main reasons for the drop in mortality seems to be a reduction in cancer mortality. And that's been looked at very um, thoroughly in mice, where there have been long-term <coughs> studies on um, diets with different protein um, content. And the mice are kind of slightly on a knife edge when they're young. So mice and people have a, a protein target. So if we eat a diet that has too little protein in, we will overeat to get the required amount of protein and therefore get too much of the other constituents of the diet, and that leads to overweight. So that there's a satiety issue, but there's also an issue with too much protein on this side, which again um, increases both the incidence of tumors and their progression in mice, probably because of higher circulating levels of IGF-1 in the blood. However, things turn around when mice and people get older uh, where it's better to um, actually increase the amount of protein because an increasing problem then is sarcopenia and high protein, sorry, um, loss of muscle mass. So high protein in the diet maintains muscle function better in old mice and in old people. But also, it turns out timing of food intake is very important. So we're now in the artificial situation where particularly as adults, most of us um, have some form of activity during the day, including work. We've got electric lights, so we can extend the day into the evening. And often people in developed countries actually eat their main meal in the evening, when actually we should be doing exactly the opposite. So there's been some very nice experimental work with mice looking at time-restricted feeding. So they basically either get given their food um, at the start of the night, which is when mice are active, or the same amount of food, but throughout uh, the, the whole feeding period, they, they just have ad-lib access to food. And it turns out that if you do this, if you start out with a genetically obese mice, which is used a lot in metabolism research, if they can eat when they like, they get morbidly obese, time restricted, they're still fat, but they're extremely fit and have a very good uh, metabolic profile. If you do the same with ordinary lean mice, basically similar. They, get, they put on a lot of weight and become unhealthy if they can eat when they like. But if they only eat at breakfast time, then you get a lean fit mouse. And actually they did a, a, a rather hilarious experiment here where they let them have the weekend off from this <laughs> regime. And they found that they could get most of the benefits if they just did it five days a week. And, and with humans, there have also been experiments showing that you put on much less weight if you eat the same amount of food but weight it towards breakfast time. So there's a real circadian thing. And almost what, certainly what we're seeing here, both with the mice and us, is a rescue of what's basically an unnaturally unhealthy lifestyle that wouldn't have existed in our evolutionary past. So laboratory animals, of course, are practically sitting in their food. They're protected against disease. They don't have to fight to get mates. They're, they're, they're living a very easy life. But so are we. <laughs> and I think a lot of the things that can improve health during aging are basically tackling this. And of course, exercise is the other huge one. It's very clear. So I think what we're looking at here is the promise of treating the underlying causes of these diseases to prevent them. And increasingly, this is catching on with the health economists, people running health systems, even with clinicians. I, I think a lot more attention is being paid to the aging process itself. And it, it's clear that if, if we can tackle the underlying processes, we can actually probably help both improve the quality of people's lives and save health systems a lot of money. So this just summarizes what I've said. Aging's turned out to be a surprisingly malleable process, and we know something now about the genes that, that cause it and that can be tamped down to help it. And these nutrient sensing networks are very important. Um, and diet mutations and drugs can protect against diverse aging-related diseases, and I think we're looking forward to the prospect of a broad-spectrum preventative medicine, or at least I hope we are. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and for coming. Wasn't that an absolutely fascinating talk? We, we do have um, some time for questions. Um, so, and we have two roaming microphones that were going around. So if you'd like to ask a question, 
you could raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, also, just to say that we are filming today. We're not filming the audience, so you don't need to worry about your hairstyle or anything. But, um, but uh, in order for us to be able to record your question, we need to be able to have, wait for a microphone. So if anybody would like to ask a question. Yes, we have here, down here. Are you going to live for a long time? Because you're going to be running. <laughs> Thanks, Edna. Thanks for a lovely talk. Um, I, I was just wondering, so I guess a, a straightforward question is, why don't we have these systems already? And, and the sort of one phenotype that's missing is reproduction. So is the reason that we are like we are and not like we should be to um, live more healthily in, in old age is because of the trade-offs to do with reproduction? That, that's a very interesting question. A lot of these mutations and even dietary interventions can actually extend lifespan in animals that are completely sterile. So it, although probably reproduction in the wild when animals are on a very low plane of nutrition is challenging and, and you see trade-offs much more clearly, in these animals and probably in us in a good nutritional situation, good health situation, that, that's not so much of an issue. In fact, I think most of the things that go wrong during aging in developed countries are to do with the fact that we're living way beyond the time that natural selection ever saw us in the wild. So everybody was dead by 40 anyway. So what we've got is bodies running on into a territory that natural selection's never been able to deal with because it's never got to see it. And what we're seeing is run on of processes that are beneficial in, in youth. So insulin IGFs are classic. You know, it's sitting there, how much food have you got? Can you reproduce? Can you run around? Can you grow? Can you do all this stuff? And actually once it's dealing with an old body where the cells can't respond so well to being told to do things, it drives them into you know, cell senescence, DNA damage, all the things that happen during aging. So I think it's because we're completely out of our evolutionary history, both in terms of the length of time that we live and the kinds of circumstances in which we live. And what most of these interventions are doing are rescuing those two things. That's how I think about it, anyway. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Hi. Uh, just a general question, sorry. Um, as the research shows the woman life expectancy always better than men. And in terms of the cancer survival, women always show better life expectancy. I wonder if just this is because of the genetic or you think it's because of the diet? So, like, you know. so I think historically it's not always been true that women have had higher life expectancy than men, simply because um, death around pregnancy and childbirth used to be much higher than it is now. So if you go back to Elizabethan times, women tended to live a lot less long than men, for that, mainly for that reason. <coughs> so what we're seeing now is partly the effects of modern, <coughs> modern medicine and obstetrics, which I think has, has turned that one over. Um, why it is that women live longer than men when that's not an issue, I think nobody really quite understands. There's been discussion about whether it's to do with the fact that one of the male chromosomes, the X chromosome, um, is actually unguarded because it's got a Y opposite it, so any mutations on that are immediately going to be expressed. It's just one idea. Um, it could be because um, men are very strongly sexually selected to grow fast, um, to all of the things that involve IGF-1 and insulin, basically, and it may be that that's shortening their lives. I think we don't really know the answer. And it's not clear why so many of these interventions are more effective in females. I think there's some biology in there that we just don't understand at the moment. I think it's a very interesting question. <coughs> Sorry, we'll, excuse me. We'll find them in some water. Mm -hmm. There's one more question up there. Hi, I was just wondering about epigenetic processes, which you've not mentioned in the talk, and whether there's any cross-generational impacts on these genes that might affect the rate yeah, of aging? Very much so. Um, so one of the main um, cross-generational things that happened was discovered um, looking first of all at the Dutch hunger winter 
um, during the war and the children that were born during that. Um, but also uh, populations that move, for instance, um, from parts of Asia where nutritional levels are very low um, to Britain or to other European countries and then move on to high plane of nutrition and what happens. And it turns out basically that children that are born to mothers who are very nutritionally stressed in the early stages of pregnancy go on to have a very high susceptibility to metabolic disease. So they're much more likely in the new regime um, to get diabetes, to get cardiovascular disease, to, uh, to become obese, all of the things that um, tend to go wrong in our societies. And there's a lot of interest in, in exactly what's going on there. So it could be that the fetus in an undernourished mother is actually being programmed to have a kind of physiology that can cope with un being undernourished. Nobody's ever directly looked at that whether there's, this is a programming process that's saying you're going to have a very hard time nutritionally during your life, so reset your metabolism to deal with that. And then when it, that metabolism is confronted with really good nutrition, it gets into trouble. That's one possible interpretation. But the phenomenon's very clear. Those children are at much higher risk of metabolic disease. And there are um, rat and mouse models of exactly the same thing, where you can alter the nutrition of the, the mother during particularly the early stages of pregnancy and again see this susceptibility in the offspring. And it turns out that at least some of what's happening is almost certainly what's called uh, genetic um, sort of imprinting methylation. The pattern of modifications on the DNA changes in the offspring of those nutritionally stressed mother. And these are often genes that are involved in control of metabolism. So there are definitely intergenerational effects there, yeah. And in worms, actually, they've been reported to go across five whole generations. So they can be very persistent. Yeah. There may also be similar things going on within generations. So we've done some work with mice recently that shows that if an animal has um, a history as an adult, but as a young adult, of being on a high level of nutrition, it subsequently becomes unable to respond to dietary restriction. Something gets locked down, so it can no longer get the health benefits of dietary restriction. And we're trying to find out what that is at the moment. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. If any more questions? There's one down here at the front. Can you hear me? I don't know whether this is appropriate, but I'm just wondering about exercise amongst the other animals, what effect that has on aging in terms of the genetic makeup of muscle or muscle weakness in cultures? That it's very, very interesting. So there's been a lot of... Um, I thought that might be a stupid question. That's not, no, I think it's, a, it's a, a burning interest question, I think. Um, the, the question is, what's the effect of exercise on aging? You know, what, what, what's the story with exercise? And um, there, there's been a lot of analysis of, you know, lifespans in athletes, but, you know, other very active um, categories of people. And there doesn't, there's certainly no obvious effect on lifespan either way. So it doesn't make you live longer. Um, but all of the indications are that it's highly protective um, against cardiovascular disease long term. And also, if you look at changes in gene expression in tissues of older people, they very much mimic similar things that happen in younger people who are sedentary. So it looks as though a lot of what we're calling aging is, is actually more to do with the fact that older people do tend to sit down more. They just do become less active. And a lot of what happens to them is a direct consequence of that rather than just their chronological age. And it's very well known in GP surgery. They have a category of person called women who walk. So you know, the, the, a lot of older people do very actively go walking every day, and it does seem to be associated with improved health and function during aging, if not with increased lifespan. But that's, of course, what we want. We want more health, not necessarily more lifespan, and exercise seems to be a really good way of getting that. It reverses a lot of the things that typically do happen during aging. And, of course, it's great for muscle function. Okay, one last question. 
We hear a lot about superfoods. Are there things that we really should eat that are going to do us some good? And are there some that we shouldn't? Well, we know about cake and stuff, but <laughs> are there really some that we should really avoid and some that we sh really should eat? I, I think the take-home message about food is not too much of anything, and especially in younger people, don't eat too much protein. That, that seems to be clear. And, and the animal studies that suggest um, if you do eat protein, eating protein with the kind of um, chemical constituents that are present in plant protein is somewhat healthier than eating animal protein, particularly red meat protein. I think that's where things stand at the moment. It's really a pretty simple message. Well, thank you very much, Linda. I think now what we'd like to do is um, the School of Biology, Equality and Diversity Committee, and on behalf of all of you, is to express our thanks uh, for the talk. And we have a small gift for you. Oh, um, this is a work of art by um, a local artist who um, was actually a PhD student here at St Andrews. Um, but is now um, an award-winning artist, award artist for wildlife. And we're hoping that the subject matter will be of uh, interest to you. So we have uh, a lovely painting. Oh, it's a blue tip. Blue tip. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, well, the subject matter is of passionate interest. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's just one of the creatures from my PhD. So, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's lovely. So, Thank you so much. It's our it's pleasure. We've, uh, you've been wonderful today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Before you leave, could you, can, could you fill in one of the feedback forms that you'll find on your seat? And um, there are tea and coffees available in the foyer if you'd like to um, stay and talk for a little bit longer. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.